Kia Tambayong Saya Chris Dayanti Saya Kalista Iskandar Saya Desa Radian Saya Chico Jericho Saya Chelsea Islam Saya Cinta Laura Kiel Saya Dian Sastrowardoyo Saya Wulan Guritno Saya Julia Stel Saya Yoshi Suraso Saya sangat semangat menyongsong Indonesia, Indonesia Emas 100 tahun yang merdeka pada tahun 2045 nanti Kita semua di Indonesia bermimpi dan menginginkan agar bisa mencapai tujuan Indonesia emas di tahun 2045. Sungguh suatu capaian sejarah yang indah dan luar biasa dalam perjalanan bangsa kita. Nggak kebayang betapa hebatnya Indonesia emas nanti. Insya Allah pada tahun 2045 saya akan mulai mewariskan Indonesia kepada putra-putri saya. Di usia NKRI yang 100 tahun nanti, saya ingin kita semua hidup dalam Indonesia yang Pancasilais, yang modern, maju, makmur, sejahtera, hijau, adil, aman, bebas, korupsi, demokratis, dan tentunya bersatu. Tujuan tersebut bukan tanpa tantangan. Ancaman terbesar di tahun 2045 bukanlah pandemi. Bukan lagi kemiskinan atau kebodohan. Bukan separatisme. Bukan perang nuklir. Bukan invasi militer dari luar. Ancaman terbesar bangsa Indonesia di tahun 2045 nanti. The mother of all problems adalah pemanasan global. Di mana suhu bumi rata-rata akan naik 3-4 derajat Celcius. Itu adalah suhu terpanas sepanjang sejarah manusia. Suhu terpanas di bumi kita yang sudah berusia 4,5 miliar tahun. Suhu tinggi akan membuat planet bumi sakit parah. Saya tidak mau melihat Indonesia emas dan anak-anak kita nanti hidup sengsara dalam bumi yang panas ini. Dengan perubahan cuaca yang ekstrim di mana-mana. Polusi merajalela dan membunuh puluhan juta orang. Hujan deras dan banjir di mana-mana. Gunung es di Antartika terus mencair. Air laut akan naik setinggi 1 meter. Sumber air dunia akan berkurang dengan sangat drastis. Banyak pulau yang akan tenggelam. Semakin banyak spesies punah yang disebut the sixth extinction. Keragaman hayati akan rusak. Suhu air laut yang naik. Ekosistem laut yang terancam. Serta terumbu karang yang banyak mati. Penyakit semakin banyak menyebar. Termasuk malaria. Stok pangan menurun banyak. dan kekeringan di mana-mana. Banyak tanah yang akan menjadi padang pasir tandus. Dan konflik berbasis lingkungan yang meningkat juga secara drastis. Semua ini akibat ulah manusia. Namun, malapetaka ini dapat, dapat juga, juga dicegah oleh manusia. manusia. Karena itulah, ayo kita selamatkan Indonesia dari bumi panas. Mari kita mulai mengurangi emisi gas rumah kaca Indonesia. Ayo kita kurangi emisi gas rumah kaca 50% di tahun 2030 Dan kita kurangi terus sampai akhirnya kita bisa mencapai nol emisi di tahun 2050 Ayo hijaukan ekonomi kita, jaga hutan kita Jaga ekosistem laut kita Kembangkan energi bersih dan kurangi segala emisi karbon dalam kehidupan kita Sehingga Indonesia emas 2045 akan hidup dalam bumi yang nyaman, sehat, dan bahagia Sehingga Indonesia dapat menjadi bagian penting dalam solusi global perubahan iklim. Planet bumi harus kita sembuhkan dari sekarang. Target besar dan mulia ini bisa kita capai. Ayo kita bergotong royong. Selamatkan planet bumi. Selamatkan umat manusia. Selamatkan generasi kita dan generasi seterusnya. Kita sambut Indonesia emas yang penuh harapan. Selamatkan Indonesia 2045. Sadarkah Anda, kita mungkin adalah generasi terakhir yang bisa hidup dalam dunia bercuaca normal. Kita juga adalah satu-satunya generasi yang bisa menyelamatkan umat manusia dari bahaya bumi mendidik yang menanti kita selamanya di depan. Ayo kita penuhi panggilan planet bumi, panggilan umat manusia, dan panggilan sejarah. Ayo sebarkan pesan ini dan tanda tangani petisi. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Welcome to In Conversation with COP26 President, the Honorable Alok Sharma from the UK. Good afternoon to everyone who's joining us today. I'm told that we have attendees from more than 15 countries, not just from Indonesia, but from India, Turkey, Netherlands, and even Nigeria. My name is Dino Jalal, Chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. the largest foreign policy group in the country, and I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, 
the Honorable Pak Alok Sharma. Welcome, Pak pa Alok. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharma was previously British Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. He was also Secretary of State for International Development and also Minister of State for Housing and Planning and for the Department of Communities and Local Government. So you've had a lot of uh, jobs and, and long-standing experience. That's just half the list. That's just half <laughs> the list, exactly. Uh, and now he's the President-designate of the UN Framework Convention of Climate Change Conference of the Parties 2021 or known also as COP26, basically is the UN Global Climate uh, Conference. And he's uh, active leading the preparation for Global Climate Summit, which is to be held in Glasgow this November, and which is why he is now in Jakarta. Uh, pa Alok, uh, welcome to Jakarta, and I hope you're enjoying the warm uh, weather here. Well, Patrick, you know, thank you for having me. Um, well, it's nice and cool in this room, uh, but it is, it is warm outside, and the welcome has been very warm, I can tell you that. Good. Well, you're, you're among friends here, and I hope you will have a productive uh, stay. Uh, but Sharma, let me ask you with the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge job, uh, the COP26 in, in, in Glasgow, and uh, there's been some calls that it should be postponed again. Uh, I believe that it should not be, uh, obviously. And uh, there's been a lot of COPs. Yeah? This is number 26. Yeah? In, in the... Uh, in, in the time frame of the long-standing climate negotiations, how important is the COP26 in Glasgow this year? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that uh, question. I, mean, I think the first thing to say is that, of course, uh, COP26 uh, has already been delayed by one year. Yes. And during that year, we have not seen climate change abate. Uh, in, in fact, I mean, last year was the hottest year on record. The last mm -hmm. decade was the hottest on record. Mm -hmm. And when I have uh, gone around the world, uh, both virtually and physically speaking to countries, What's been very clear is that people understand, the countries understand, the governments understand that we need to act now. Uh, and I'm not hearing uh, the uh, calls for, for delays. Uh, on the contrary, actually, mm -hmm. what people want is for us to get on with it. And what's also really important, I think, particularly for developing countries, mm -hmm. is that we have a physical event, mm -hmm. and that they're able to sit at the same table mm -hmm. with the developed nations, with the big emitters, look them in the eye and during these negotiations, and that can only happen physically, face to face. People have to understand this is a 197 parties coming together for a negotiation. Uh, so we are doing everything we can to ensure that uh, this will be a safe event, mm -hmm. looking at all the eventualities. But I can tell you that uh, I am very much planning on a physical event in Glasgow in November. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the world needs and that's what we're planning for. Yeah. So in the context of the follow up to the Paris, uh, Paris uh, Climate Treaty, uh, what is the significance of, of uh, the COP26? Yeah. Well, so in Paris, of course, the world came together and world leaders came mm -hmm. together and uh, they agreed that uh, we would do everything we could to limit global temperature rises to two degrees, in fact, close to 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the key message that I want coming out of COP26 is that the world came together and we kept the 1.5 degree target within reach. Mm -hmm. I think that has to be the overarching hope uh, of Glasgow. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing the impact of climate change around the world. I mean, you see this in Indonesia, you see it around the world. We are, you know, science tells us that we are uh, over one degrees in terms of average global mm. temperature rises. Mm. Um, we're seeing rising sea levels, the impact of that on people's mm. lives. We are mm. seeing droughts. We are seeing uh, uh, locust infestations in, in parts of Africa. I mean, I have traveled around in this role and talked to communities which have been displaced Mm -hmm. literally displaced from their homes mm -hmm. because of climate change. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's why it's very important that we make progress uh, and we do everything we can to keep that 1.5 degrees within reach. Uh, and as part of that, mm -hmm. I'm asking countries to come forward with um, their net zero commitments mm -hmm. by the middle of the century. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that when we started this process uh, on the road to COP26, less than 30% of the world economy was covered by a net zero target. We're now at 70%, but we need all countries to come forward on that journey. And then also to set out mm -hmm. their emission reductions targets as near-term targets to 2030, which then align with a net zero trajectory. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the reality is that if global temperatures continue to rise, we are going to see very many more, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of people mm -hmm. affected, lives and livelihoods. Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I correct in, in saying that the Paris Treaty was... Uh, flexible in terms that not too many countries submitted uh, an ambitious uh, emission reduction target 
But COP26, they really need to get serious. They really need to come with an ambitious target, with clear, uh, measurable uh, targets. Uh, yeah. Is that well? Uh, well I, th I think I mean you're, you're absolutely right. Is that the NDCs at the time yeah. weren't going to take us to uh, exactly. one point five degrees? Yeah. But what we need now is for countries to do that. And and you know, fr frankly, uh, the next ten years are going to decide the fate of the planet. Mm. Uh, this is the decisive decade, and therefore we need countries to come forward. Uh, in terms of those near-term emission reduction targets, I think 61 NDCs have now come forward representing yes. 88 countries. Mm -hmm. That's great, but we need everyone to come forward with ambition. And, uh, you know, I've just uh, uh, chaired the uh, G7 uh, Climate and Environment Ministers meeting. Uh, and that was very positive because on the road to that, we've now got every G7 nation has agreed to uh, ambitious 2030 emission reductions targets, to net zero by 2050, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. Uh, but what we need is for everyone to move forward on that. Uh, and clearly, we need uh, the G20 countries, including Indonesia, to move forward. Yeah. Is there a risk of countries who put up ambitious NDCs, uh, emission reduction targets, but don't really perform uh, because it's not followed by a, a plan to achieve those emission targets yet? Is there a risk of that? Yeah. Well, I think that's why it's so important that countries set out their, their long-term strategies as to how they're going to, to mm. uh, deliver on the ambition. Mm. So to go with the ambition, you need to have the action that goes with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, you will know that as uh, uh, part of uh, closing off the Paris Agreement, we have, uh, we're still negotiating issues on transparency. Mm. Uh, so we'll see where all of that comes to. But there's no doubt that we want countries to set out their long-term strategy to actually get to net zero by the middle of the century. That's going to be absolutely key to this. And I think there's a, an opportunity for countries to work together as well. You know, mm. as part of the, the COP26 process, um, we have set up a, a Energy Transition Council where uh, ministers from around the world, including our friends in Indonesia, have come together. Uh, we discuss how we can work together to have a transition to clean energy. Uh, we have a Zero Emission Vehicles Transition Council as well, where some of the biggest car uh, markets in the mm. world, mm. ministers from those governments coming together to see how we can have that move to electric vehicles. So there's a lot of work that can be done collaboratively, but it does need every country to step forward and show what precise action they're going to take to deliver on their ambition. Mm. You know, there's always been this uh, back and forth tussle between developed countries and developing countries. Hey, you go first and we follow you later and so on. Yeah. And this had been part of the debate for many years. Mm -hmm. Do you see heading towards COP26 that uh, this dichotomy between developed and developing countries on climate approach is, is uh, becoming different? I mean, now the biggest emitter is no longer the United States. It's, it's a developing country, which is mm -hmm. China, right? And China's ambitions is larger than all of uh, mm -hmm. developed countries' emissions together, right? So do, do you see there's also a political and psychological shift and diplomatic shifts uh, to, to do things a bit differently at COP26? Yeah, look, I, I, th I think uh, certainly the conversations I've had is that, you know, mm -hmm. every country recognizes this is the time to act. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, I've, when I'm having discussions with, with, with ministers, uh, you know, everyone says they are committed to uh, delivering on success on the road to an at COP26. And of course, what we need is all countries to step up and do that. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting if you look at some of the countries that have mm -hmm. set out really ambitious uh, emission reduction targets, uh, they are developing countries, they are small island states mm. on the front line of climate change, yeah. and they weren't necessarily responsible for uh, you know, creating what we are having to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they have shown a moral authority in stepping mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. and it's now up to all countries, particularly the big emitters, to come forward and set out ambition as well. Uh, I mean, I think it's been, for, for me, I think it's great that uh, we've got the U.S. Mm -hmm. back on the front line in the fight against climate change. Mm -hmm. I think that's made a, a material difference. And they themselves, of course, set out a ambitious uh, uh, emission reductions target for 2030 as well. Well, we need everyone. And I go back to this point is that if you look at the G20, the G20 is made up of uh, developing countries, developed countries. Uh, but we need everyone to act in concert if we are going to keep 1.5 within reach. Yeah. You know, here at uh, FPCI, we've been uh, struggling to mobilize public opinion about climate uh, security because uh, everyone's very involved with uh, COVID, which is the number one yes. thing on their mind. I'm just wondering, uh, as you go around the world, mm -hmm. including to Indonesia, how will you convince the public opinion, mm -hmm. not just the government, uh, that, uh, hey, you know, we've got a COVID crisis, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important. 
but uh, you really can't ignore the climate uh, yeah, danger. Yeah, well, you, you're right. I mean, the COVID crisis uh, is, um, you know, urgent uh, today, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, you know, countries have stepped up uh, to provide finance, raise finance, and support lives and livelihoods in their countries. I mean, that's right and proper. What, what I am saying is that we need to apply the same urgency to tackling climate change that we have applied to uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, that also means, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the big issues for me is ensuring that um, the donor countries are stepping forward and helping to provide finance for developing countries. Mm -hmm. Now, back in 2009, donor countries said that, uh, you know, we'd be raising by 2020 100 billion dollars a year mm -hmm. to support developing economies. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one of the things that I'm pushing very, very hard mm -hmm. with donor countries. And I'm making the case to them that actually this is a matter of trust. Mm -hmm. This is something we've promised. We must deliver it to support uh, developing countries. And we also are working to ensure that we can try and unleash mm -hmm. uh, you know, the trillions of dollars that's required from private finance as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot of money that's available. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that that money from the private sector can also reach uh, climate resilient infrastructure. And what I would say, I mean, I, I, I certainly have noticed this, is that I think in the last few years, you are seeing a change where governments, businesses, civil society are starting to speak from the same voice. Uh, and I think there is an inflection point where the whole of society is realizing that we need to take action on this. And I think that's very positive. But of course, well, you know, one of the things I'm doing on every mm -hmm. visit that I do uh, is meet youth and civil society groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's very important that NGOs, civil society groups, youth keep making the case mm -hmm. and keep holding governments to account it doesn't matter where they are in the world. I think that's really important. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And and uh, my my experience is that when you tell them the uh, information, the the the, uh, the statistics and the danger ahead, they they usually uh, digest it uh, quite well and respond. Uh, absolutely. And I think you know if we talk about you know what is the I mean I would argue and I've argued this consistently is mm -hmm. that the actually the cost of inaction on climate change is mm -hmm. far greater than the cost of action. Uh, I mean, you will be aware, you know, the Stern review, which came out, which said that, you know, it, unabated climate change, uh, you know, we could be talking about a cost of up to 20% of yeah. global GDP. Yeah. I mean, that is a huge number. And we see this in our day to day lives, right? I mean, if you people will see what happens when there is flooding, what happens uh, when sea level rises, the damage that does to lives and livelihoods, that is what we need to arrest now. And I think that's why. And I yeah. think this, there is this growing realization that we need to act now. I just want over the next five months for all countries to step up to the plate and say, right, we're going to act, we're going to put out ambitious mm, targets, mm. and we're going to put out an ambitious plan to deliver on those targets. Yeah. You, you know, I think one problem, one problem with that, uh, uh, Minister uh, Alok, is that in Indonesia and in many other countries, things, bad things need to happen first before they realize how bad it is. Like, like COVID also. Mm. Uh, in, in the beginning, people just said, uh, you know, it's not going to happen, but then it hit us, then they developed this uh, yeah. uh, crisis mentality. Yeah. So I think that's the challenge for you yeah. and, you know, yeah. for all of us, uh, yeah. that things don't need to happen first before no. we take no, action. And, and you're yeah. right, but I mean, yeah. you know, people just have to look around the world. I mean, yeah. you know, bad things, as you put it, are happening in terms mm -hmm. of the impact of climate change. You, you see that, I mean, millions of people being affected uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't matter where you are. And I, I always make the point that actually... Climate change doesn't respect borders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens in one part of the world impacts on another part of the world. And that's why the challenge is a shared challenge. Yeah. And, and it's true also, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but once the temperature of the world rises to four degrees, you can't lower it again, right? Uh, we're stuck with that permanently. Uh, well, I, I, I hope, <laughs> I really hope we are not going, yes. going there. I mean, I hope that countries recognize that, that we need to keep this 1.5 within reach. Uh, there will be a report from the IPCC, which mm -hmm. will come out uh, later on this year. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what that says. Uh, but I, I do think the science is telling us that you know, temperatures are continuing to rise, and we are seeing with our own eyes the impact of that around the world. And so people need to wake up and understand that we need to act. Yes, we, I'm going to take a question from one of our audience, uh, Adri Yanti Lau. She asks, why do we need to keep uh, the 1.5 degree uh, limit? And what is the big impact if we cross the rise of 1.5 Celsius uh, threshold? And is it possible to maintain it uh, below that threshold? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And I think, uh, you know, I would just say, uh, in response to that is, uh, you know, the science tells us we're already at over one degrees. Look around the world. Look mm -hmm. at 
uh, you know, the trillions of dollars of damage that is being done because of climate change. Look at the, you know, millions of lives that are being affected around the world because of climate change. You know, look and see what it is doing in terms of stunting economic growth. Mm. And, you know, th 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 there is a, a very positive case that, um, you know, everyone should be making, which is that at the end of the day, this is not a, a choice between mm. fixing uh, the environment and growth. I mean, you can have green growth. Mm -hmm. uh, countries have shown that around the world. I mean, in the UK, for instance, and I know every economy is different, but in the UK, over the last 30 years, we've managed to grow our economy by over 70%, and yet we have cut emissions mm -hmm. by over 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, and our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has set out a, 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 a plan for a green industrial revolution, as he calls it, where we are investing alongside the private sector. This is really important. Public money, mm -hmm. absolutely, but you need to have leverage from the private sector uh, we are investing in uh, rejuvenating industries and making sure that we're investing in sunrise industries for the future, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, but high value jobs and at the same time cutting emissions. And when I talk to governments around the world, that is what they all want to see. I mean, it's the same here. I've, I've met some of the ministers here. I'll be meeting some more. There is a focus on green growth, and that's what needs to be delivered. Well, look, we have another question from our audience, Lulita Milasari. She asks, how can we afford to finance COVID-19 recovery while also addressing climate change and fulfilling the SDGs, all without increasing debt? Um, great question. Um, and uh, what, what I would say is that um, at the end of the day, actually, the, the, the cost of uh, uh, inaction is greater than the cost of action in this case. Uh, and uh, you know, I, you'll have read the Stern Review from a few years ago mm -hmm. where uh, uh, Nick Stern set out the case of what would happen, what would be the cost of unabated climate change. And uh, he talked about a cost of up to 20% mm. of global GDP. That is a huge amount of money. Uh, but of course, uh, it is the case that we need uh, donor countries, mm. developed countries to support mm. developing economies. Uh, and that's why I'm pushing very hard that donor countries deliver on the promise that was made to uh, have 100 billion uh, raised in, in finance to support uh, developing uh, economies. Uh, and uh, for me, that is very much a, a case as a matter of trust. Uh, and that is what... And we, credibility. It's trust, yeah. credibility. Yeah. And, you know, at, at COP26, we're going to be starting to talk about what mm. comes post-2025 in terms of financing. Uh, well, actually, what people want to see is what we're delivering for the 2020 to 2025 uh, uh, range of, of years as well. Um, I think the other thing is that there is uh, uh, more that we can get the multilateral development banks to do. Uh, I'm very pleased that, for instance, the World Bank has said they're going to be uh, aligning their finance flows with uh, the Paris Agreement. That's great news. We need all MDBs to come forward uh, on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen the recent discussion on SDRs from the IMF as well. Um, so you know, we'll see where that goes forward. Uh, but then the other sort of piece of this is to ensure that um, we have financing from the private sector mm -hmm. also coming forward. And the reality is there is a lot of money. The private sector wants to invest, mm. but they just need to ensure that when countries set out their policies, there's a long term and they have confidence in the long term policy. Uh, and secondly, that they're able to see some sort of return as well from the investment they make. Uh, and, you know, you look around the world, uh, you know, I have examples in the UK where we've made this work uh, you know, just in, uh, in, in 2012, 40 percent of our energy uh, electricity generation came from coal power. Mm -hmm. It's now less than 2%. Mm -hmm. By 2024, we'll phase this out completely. And the reason we were able to do that is because we grew our offshore wind sector. So over a 20-year period, we have gone from uh, just uh, uh, the offshore wind sector supplying a few thousand homes to now being the biggest offshore wind sector in the world. Mm -hmm. And the reason we were able to do this is we put in place revenue mechanisms which allowed the private sector to invest uh, and therefore... Uh, expand that particular sector. So I think there is financing available. We just need to make sure that it is directed to the right places and that we particularly do a lot to get the private sector also financing uh, climate resilient infrastructure. You know, it's very interesting you mentioned uh, your experience with coal uh, and taking that out of the energy system and usually taking a whole industry out of the economy where there are a lot of jobs uh, and everything becomes a very political issue. Right? Mm. How did you manage the politics of it? Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think this, this plays to the, the, uh, uh, what people talk about, the fact that there needs to be a just transition. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely vitally important, is that uh, if we're going to have this transition, 
we need to ensure that people whose jobs are going to be displaced are able to get new jobs and it comes into into you know people being trained mm -hmm. um, a few days ago i was actually uh, in the uk and i went to see a, a geothermal project mm -hmm. that was ongoing and people who were working on that site mm -hmm. were those who had come from the oil and gas sector so there were transferable mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. that they already had and i think that's what we need to look is how do you get those transferable skills across uh, to new energy sectors uh, how do you get uh, you know, training and skills available for people to move into new energy sectors? I mean, this is absolutely possible, mm. but it is. I think it's very important, this, this idea of a just transition. Um, and if you look at, um, uh, I mean, we, we sort of talk about coal. Uh, I mean, the, the other area is uh, electric vehicles. I mean, I know, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, here in Indonesia, uh, the government has a desire to get more electric cars, more yes. two-wheelers, two mm -hmm. uh, electric two-wheelers mm -hmm. on, the, on the road as well, uh, which is great. Now, what we did in the UK was actually set a date uh, of 2030, after which uh, there won't be any more sale of new petrol and diesel uh, mm -hmm. cars. Mm -hmm. um, I was the, our business minister when this decision was made, so of course I spent a lot of time talking to our car manufacturers. And the reason that that landed mm -hmm. well is because first, they saw a very clear policy direction. They understood what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we did also, we are providing financing to support that particular industry to develop, uh, to get gigafactories built, to support the supply chain industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, that's just what we need to see around the world, where as governments look to transition, they're also providing support to these new industries, but helping people to reskill mm -hmm. so they can move into these new jobs. Yeah. Do, do you imagine a, a political situation around the world, including in the Western world, whereby the credibility of leaders in elections will be determined by their climate agenda? I, I think you're seeing that in mm -hmm. certain countries already around the world. I mean, yeah. I, I won't go into the details, but I've been to, to uh, uh, countries uh, where actually climate is the number one issue mm -hmm. in, in, in elections. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you are. We're not there yet in Indonesia, but no? well, I mean, who knows? Who knows? With your so, with yeah, your yeah. with your One support day, yeah. and everybody listening in, maybe yeah. maybe you'll get there. Yeah. But but I think there is this growing realization around the world. I mean, you you look at some of the opinion polling that's happened around the world. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, people do want a cleaner environment. They do want their children to be able to breathe clean air. Mm -hmm. uh, they do want to ensure that mm -hmm. uh, their children have uh, you know good jobs uh, for the future. So I think there is this growing awakening, if I can call it like that. Mm -hmm. But certainly we see in certain countries uh, the green movement and the whole issue on our environment being front and center when it comes to uh, decisions at elections. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really hope we get to, to, to that point. Uh, that, that will be a, uh, a good political uh, development. Mm -hmm. uh, do you expect, uh, you mentioned about the private sector uh, being a great source of change. Do you, do you expect funding for climate mitigation from the private sector to exceed, way exceed uh, funding from the government, the, the 100 billion uh, that, uh, is, uh, that you mentioned? Well, I mean, it, it, it needs to. Uh, yes. I mean, uh, you know, if we're going to have the sort of uh, economies that we want in the future, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then actually it's going to need trillions of dollars mm -hmm. to be unleashed from the private sector to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think what's very encouraging is that the private sector has understood this. And, uh, you know, we, we, we are running a, a campaign called Race to Zero, which is a UN campaign. Mm -hmm. it's, it's run by uh, the, the high level champions. Yeah, well, oh, there we go. There you go. Here we go. There we go. That's be it. Zero. Be, 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 be a hero. I think that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but we, we have uh, uh, lots of very large companies that have signed up to this. Mm -hmm. We've got um, yeah, regions signed up to this, cities signed up to, uh, to this uh, Race to Zero campaign. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is that you are committing as an entity to be net zero by 2050 at the latest, but on science-based targets, mm -hmm. setting out the path where how you're going to get there. And you have lots of business signing up to this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've just launched something called uh, GFANS, which is the, uh, the Glasgow Finance uh, mm -hmm. Alliance. And basically these are uh, uh, companies, uh, financial companies coming together saying they're gonna get a net zero as part of what they do. Um, there is a subset of this, which is the, um, uh, Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, uh, thirty-seven trillion dollars, mm -hmm. thirty-seven trillion mm -hmm. dollars of mm -hmm. assets have mm -hmm. signed up mm -hmm. to Net Zero. We're talking about almost forty percent of that sector, and we're not stopping now. We're going forward with this. So mm -hmm. I do think that businesses have understood the direction of travel. They've understood that mm -hmm. they're going to get a better return investing in the green economy 
than in you know, more traditional economies, so I can put it like that. Mm -hmm. And you just have to have a look at the uh, market values, the market capitalizations of companies around the world which are seen as uh, leading on the green agenda mm -hmm. uh, compared to those that are not. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, investors understand this. They understand mm -hmm. where the returns are going to come from. And we spoke about coal earlier in our mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I mean, you know, w when I have discussions with the mm -hmm. private sector, there is this increasing realization that at the end of the day, what they, they do not want to do is to end up with what we would describe as stranded assets. Mm -hmm. So investing in, in, in coal power plants mm -hmm. uh, where they're going to need a return which will take sort of 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, those assets are stranded. You know, mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do with them. And at the same time, the price of renewables coming down significantly. Mm -hmm. now, if you look at a 10-year view, mm. uh, the price of solar has dropped by over 80%, the, the, the yes. price of a wind by over 50%. And it will, it will keep going down. The economies mm. of scale meaning will keep going down. So I, I do think, uh, in summary, that actually the private sector has understood this and they're acting on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just like the cell phones, right? Remember when it used to cost a fortune and it used to be Oh, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, know, you needed my... a briefcase just to fit your phone. Yes. <laughs> now each one of my staff has two cell phones, yeah. at least. Right? Yeah. So, um, Paolo, uh, I understand your point about the private sector uh, being part of the solution. I I've talked to... Uh, corporate people in Indonesia. And many of them complain that, uh, look, even if we do something uh, and we have tried to get carbon credits, uh, we haven't had a happy experience. Uh, they said, I think majority of them said uh, they're not getting enough uh, good pricing and the system remains uh, just not well run. You know, So uh, are we going to see a, a reform of, of mm. the carbon uh, uh, credit system throughout the world so that uh, the businesses in developing countries can uh, also uh, be on board. Yeah. yeah. So you know, obviously one of the, the, the big issues uh, from the Paris Agreement was Article 6 on, mm. on carbon markets. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, you know what we need to do uh, at COP26 is to ensure that we're closing off all the elements of the Paris rulebook, including on carbon markets. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's a very live discussion. There are countries that have different views. Mm. But one of the things I say to all of them is that at the end of the day, if you want to deliver on this, mm. and everybody does, you're going to have to have some compromise on this. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, that's a piece of work that obviously we're doing as part of our COP agenda. I think there is a wider point uh, where countries are looking at how do you deal with carbon leakage. Mm -hmm. And you have emission trading schemes around the, the, the world. You know, We in the UK, have, having left the European Union, have set up our own emissions trading scheme. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also uh, you know, discussion around carbon taxes. Uh, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms that are being raised. Now, that's mm -hmm. not part of the, 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 the strictly the, the COP26 agenda. That's mm -hmm. not part of the, the mandates that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. But all of this is very much in flux. And I think mm -hmm. there is a growing realization mm -hmm. that you're going to have to find a way of pricing carbon when it comes to dealing with economic growth uh, as, as well. Mm -hmm. And lots of countries are obviously thinking about this right now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, look, in this part of the world, we are worried about U.S.-China competition, right, uh, as everywhere, I guess. And there's hope that mm -hmm. at least, at least on climate change, they're going to find ways to work together, right? Uh, what do you see in terms of the possibility of U.S. and, and, and China cooperating? And, and in fact, in, in my view, even if they compete on climate change is good for everybody because that means competing for uh, who does more uh, to reduce emissions, who does more for green energy and, and so on. But, but what do you think uh, about having the climate struggle uh, being sterile, sterilized from US-China competition? Well, look, I mean, I think if there's one issue where there should be a multilateral discussion mm -hmm. and, and uh, a consensus, mm -hmm. it is on climate change. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. affects all of us. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, no one wins mm -hmm. if uh, you know, climate change continues to get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yes, I think it's very important that, that all countries, uh, China, the US, I mean, all of us uh, say that this is the burning issue of the, the day we have to deal with this collectively. Yes, we will have uh, differences of views on other issues, but we must get together and, and, and deal with this. Uh, you know, obviously, ahead of Paris, uh, the um, Americans and the Chinese uh, you know, came, came forward and um, you know, helped in terms of delivering the, the Paris Agreement, and, mm -hmm. and that, was, that was great. Um, I think it's, it's interesting. We've now got a new administration in the US. Yes. Uh, I'm very pleased that we mm -hmm. have an administration that is putting 
climate uh, uh, action at the sort of front and center of their mm. both dom dom domestic but also international priority as, as well. Mm. Now we, we've seen some uh, you know positive statements from uh, from China. So um, you know they've talked about the fact that they want to be carbon neutral before 2060. Uh, they've talked about the fact that they want to have a peaking date before 2030. They've talked about the fact that uh, they want to use less coal in their energy mix. Uh, I, I've made this point before, and I just want to repeat the fact that um, uh, you know uh, Xi Jinping has made uh, you know a range of, of of commitments. What it now needs is for the whole of the Chinese system mm. to then deliver on the commitments that have been made. And obviously, in the U.S., they've also made a range of commitments, and they're driving those forward. Uh, so I hope that we will be able mm. to have a, a, a positive discussion on how we work together on climate change. The other thing is worth pointing out that, of course, in October in Kunming, uh, China will be hosting the biodiversity COP, COP15, the CBD mm. COP. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's another area where uh, mm. you know, we need to be cooperating uh, together uh, with, with, with China and on the COP26 agenda. At the end of the day, climate mm. change and biodiversity loss are, are frankly two sides of the same coin. And so we need to be working together uh, collectively on this. So I'm hopeful that we can do this, but it does need everyone to realize that when it comes to multilateralism, this is the one issue that we absolutely have to work together on. Yeah, well, I, I really hope so, because before COVID-19 came to, uh, to the world, we all assumed that the United States and China would work together because it's so obvious, you know, we're talking about a virus that... Mm -hmm doesn't discriminate uh, yeah. between countries and it's going to ruin everybody's economy, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, in the end, uh, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, although we're seeing, you know, some good signs that, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they, might, they may uh, uh, work together better in WHO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to take one question from Rangsinda Suryat from Institute of Social and Political Science uh, in Jakarta. Uh, he asks, uh, how do we convince uh, policymakers, political elites, and, and uh, government that have not committed to higher NDCs that uh, they should uh, come out uh, as soon as possible with a stronger commitments before uh, Glasgow? Well, that's part of what I'm doing, mm -hmm. uh, going around the world and, and making that case. Uh, and um, I think what, what you see, I mean, I, I go back to this point that <clears throat> a, a year ago, if you look back a year ago, um, uh, you know, quite a lot has changed. We mm. have got uh, net zero commitments from uh, Japan, from South Korea, from the US, mm. uh, all the G7, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, <clears throat> a commitment on carbon neutrality from uh, China. Um, so a lot has moved in a year. And I do think that um, you know, countries look around and they see what everybody else is doing and they do understand that uh, you know, they also need to act. Mm. So uh, we need that momentum to, to carry on. Uh, and I think the, the, the other thing that's going to be quite important is to be able to, um, for countries to understand that, you know, I go back to this point about um, this is not either or, you, you can grow your economy. I mean, I, you know, in, in this post, in, in this sort of this, this time where COVID has uh, uh, hurt you know, economies around the world, of course, the first thought is that how do we mm -hmm. actually have a recovery? How do we make sure that we are protecting jobs and livelihoods? Uh, well, you know, I would say you need to think about how you reimagine your economies, mm -hmm. how you ensure that you have a green recovery, which is good for the environment and actually good for the economy as well. So mm -hmm. th this is a this is a, 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 a quite a unique time, actually, mm -hmm. for, for countries to be able totally. to think, for governments to be able to think yes. about how they can do this. Um, and as I said, I think people are looking at what their neighbors are doing. Uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, Indonesia is going to be uh, presiding over the G20 next year. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's. Um, uh, you know, a big, big economy in the world. And I think this is an opportunity for you know, Indonesia as well to show that sort of global climate leadership going forward. Yeah. Well, we have actually uh, propagated the new term <clears throat> by Alok. It's called the climate nationalism, uh, uh -huh. meaning that uh, you can't be nationalistic unless you are uh, pro-climate uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, security as well. Yeah, those things are p part of the same uh, parcel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to. Uh, uh, By the way, finally, I mean, this is a very, very interesting point you yeah. raised because <clears throat> I, I think this is um, uh, if, if you look at the the, uh, the move to um, you know, clean energy, the transition to renewables, for instance, mm -hmm. this is also actually about energy security mm -hmm. for individual countries. So mm -hmm. you, you have to look at this in a, a multitude of contexts. If you're a government, 
Uh, it is about cleaning the environment. It is about creating mm -hmm. jobs. But it is also about uh, having energy security yourself mm -hmm. uh, and, and knowing that you, know, you control the source of energy that uh, you, know, you are using in your economy. Yes, yeah. very true. Yeah. Palak, uh, can you uh, just take us to uh, a state of play uh, in the run-up to the uh, COP negotiations in Glasgow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of uh, who, who are the, the key players uh, that you think uh, will, will move the needle uh, during the, the, the negotiations? Yeah, so well, I, th I think this is uh, I think this is quite complex in the sense that you've of course got the big images. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've got uh, uh, China, you've got the U.S., you've got the EU, India, others. Mm -hmm. um, but it is also the case that uh, if you look at the the negotiating groups in the uh, in, in in the UNFCCC system, mm -hmm. there are a whole range of groups, uh, and some countries will be in more than one group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it is it is sort of quite complex. Um, the, the the key issue for me is ensuring that um, you know, we are working um, between now and COP26 with all parties to understand what their positions are and see where we can try and find uh, a way of reaching compromise. So uh, you know, we've had COP26 delayed for a year, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been doing anything. So our negotiating teams uh, have been working, have been having discussions. In fact, uh, we have the subsidiary body meetings taking place uh, from the uh, end of this month for three weeks where countries will come together uh, virtually uh, have a discussion around some of these key mandates and see how far we can actually move forward. Um, but I do think what will be required is uh, at some point we're going to have to have physical meetings because I think what very many countries have said is that um, they're happy to have discussions uh, virtually, but to actually do the negotiation, they need to do those face-to-face. Uh, -face. So one of the things that I, I'm looking to do is uh, uh, in, um, in, in July, I hope, to be able to pull together a, a physical meeting of a representative group of ministers so that we can actually discuss some of those key outstanding issues from the Paris rulebook. And the reality is that there's a lot that our technical negotiators can do, and they're all working very hard. Mm -hmm. But there will come a point where there are some key issues where they will need to have political input. Mm -hmm. And that means ministers coming together, ministers talking to one another, ensuring that there is going to be a, a compromise. Uh, because you know, everyone says they want to close off the, the, the Paris rule book. Mm -hmm. We haven't got there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a credibility for all of us, for the whole system, that we work together so that we can close off Article 6, common timeframes, mm -hmm. transparency. All of this is work that needs to be done between now and COP26. Mm. You know, in when we had COP13 in Bali uh, mm. some years ago, the final make or break happen in the last 10 minutes mm. of negotiations. This is when the U.S. Uh, head delegate said that, <clears throat> okay, we would go along with the consensus, right? And then the whole uh, yeah. thing changed, and then we had the Bali Declaration. Yeah. Do you expect for COP26 that you will have done most of the agreement preparations before uh, uh, delegates arrive? Or do you still expect some hard negotiations during the COP26? Uh, well, I mean, from, from uh, my understanding is that, you know, um, during that two-week period, uh, there will, of course, be uh, negotiations and discussions. Yes. Uh, but what I'm hoping is that uh, a lot of the, 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 the work leading up to that can be done before Glasgow itself. And if you look, I think there are around 130 mandates uh, mm. that need to be um, uh, agreed. Um, some of them are, are very technical, so I hope that some of that can be resolved in terms of, of the, the, um, uh, the wording that's been, been, been set out. Mm -hmm. But there's no doubt that um, you know, all countries will want to sit physically at the same table, yes. uh, and that's going to happen in Glasgow. So we will, I'm sure, see a lot of discussion at Glasgow itself as well. But it's really important, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, is that what we can't do is arrive at Glasgow without having done all our homework. Uh, that's not going to work. And that's a point that I keep making to ministers around the world. We must do our homework now. We must you know, uh, discuss among ourselves you know, what is possible in terms of compromise. You know, you, of course, you may not now, five months out, be able to reach an agreement on, on, on X or Y or Z. But please take the time to understand what is going to be required to reach agreement and where you might need to compromise mm. and where somebody else might need to compromise as well. Yeah, that will take a lot of uh, diplomatic finesse. Uh, it, it, yeah, yeah. it will, and I think one of the things that, that I'm, I'm doing is uh, on some of these key issues, 
getting pairings of uh, ministers to start to have those mm. those informal dialogues mm. um, uh, with individual countries that have a particular mm. interest, for instance, in Article 6 or common timeframes, uh, and just try and tease out what is possible. Um, mm -hmm. What what we cannot do is go down the sort of the same track mm -hmm. as previously, where people just repeat their long held positions. We we, we can't do that. And so I'm, I'm hoping that people understand that we're going to have to make sort of proper progress. And I said we've got five months to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see where we get to. Yeah. Uh, China will President Xi Jinping uh, take part in COP26? Well, he's invited. Yes, but uh, I, I hope yeah. I hope all world leaders mm -hmm. will. Will take part. I think it's uh, uh, you know the it's every few years you have a, a big COP. This is a big COP, mm -hmm. uh, and I fully expect that we will have uh, world leaders coming together at this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people have understood. Yeah. <clears throat> As I said, you know, you've seen the, the the commitments that have come out of China. I think they they absolutely understand the need to act on on, on climate change. Uh, so I hope that you know all the key world leaders will be present. Yes, I, I had the good fortune of being in a room in in Copenhagen. Where, where all the leaders were, were sitting, including President Obama. You know, it was a small <clears> room. <throat> you know, I was just carrying my president's bag at the time, you know, shining right. his shoes. <clears throat> but uh, I remember the one country that was very difficult was China. And even not, you know, President Obama was there, but China was represented by somebody uh, very junior. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, shift in attitude, I think, is... Uh, uh, from China, you know, uh, yeah. having this uh, stronger commitment uh, and hopefully even uh, take a leading role, uh, one of the leaderships uh, in, in, in climate uh, negotiations. So, so I hope I hope that will happen. Uh, but uh, we have a question uh, from Ansari. Uh, the question is, uh, what, why net zero 2050? Why, why why is uh, 2050 a magic number? Well, 2050 is a magic number because, I mean, basically the science tells us that, uh, well, firstly, the science tells us that mm -hmm. <coughs> over the next uh, 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. nine years, we need to halve global emissions to keep that 1.5 uh, degrees within reach. Uh, and uh, you know, 2050 is the point we need to get to, to mm -hmm. be able to deliver on what the world leaders agreed at mm. uh, uh, Paris. So that's mm. what 2050 is all about. Mm. And that's why you've seen so many countries that have stepped up to mm. the plate uh, and said net zero by 2050. Uh, and in fact, you know, the UK, for instance, was mm. one of the first major economies to legislate this in law. Mm. Um, you know, we are required legally, the governments of our country are required legally to work to ensure that we are at net zero by 2050. And it's not just 2050. We have uh, what we call our carbon budgets, which mm -hmm. are given to us by our independent committee on climate mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. well, they make recommendations and then we, we decide as a government whether we're going to be accept, accepting them, which we, we have done. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, some weeks ago, um, we had our sixth carbon budget announcement and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson set out the fact that uh, we will cut our emissions by 78% by 2035, mm -hmm. uh, based mm -hmm. on uh, 1990 uh, base year. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, that is on a trajectory to net zero by 2050. So um, th that is the reason that uh, we use the year 2050. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, look, out of the countries that will uh, take part in uh, COP26 in Glasgow, which mm -hmm. is the countries that you expect the most to uh, deliver uh, ambitious NDCs that hasn't uh, join uh, outside Indonesia. Mm. Yeah, uh, FPCI is actively uh, pushing the government uh, to come up with ambitious. But uh, aside from Indonesia, which other countries of uh, of consequence, mm. of climate consequence, uh, you expect? Well, I mean, look, I think all countries need to come forward. So right. this is, you know, if we're going to have success at Glasgow, it's mm. going to belong to all of us. I mean, mm. yes, the UK is mm. together with our friends in Italy. We are we are presiding over this thing. We're chairing it. Mm. At the end of the day, mm. if this works, mm -hmm. success will belong to all of us. Uh, but of course, it is also the case that the G20 mm. represents around you know, 80% of, of yes. emissions. So actually, you know, G20 nations need to step up. As I said, the G7 has already mm. done this. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I think the eyes turn to what the G20 does. I've been in, in, in Italy recently talking to Italian ministers because, of course, they have the presidency of the G20 this year. Mm. And that will come uh, just before COP26. So what mm. I have said all along is that what we want to see is this uh, 
green thread of climate action, uh, climate commitment that is made mm. on the road to COP26. There are a range of, of big uh, international events coming up. Uh, obviously, we've got the G7 uh, coming mm. uh, in, the, in the next few days. Uh, we've got uh, the, uh, the UNGA, the UN uh, General Assembly. You've got a range of others, the G20, and then COP26. And uh, actually, just going back to this, this, uh, this point you raised about, is 2050 the right date? Uh, I mean, you will have seen recently in Germany mm -hmm. that the Constitutional Court uh, made a ruling, and now the German government has moved to net zero by 2045. Mm -hmm. So I think it demonstrates that you know there is a, a growing uh, pressure as well in terms of, of, of dates. So I mean, I certainly want to see all G20 countries mm -hmm. come forward with that 2050 net zero commitment, mm -hmm. and then to have their uh, 2030 emission reduction targets, which are in line with delivering on a 2050 target. Yes. Well, I think if this year we can demonstrate that uh, climate security is politically correct and politically fashionable, a lot more governments uh, will, will yeah. introduce more ambitious uh, climate I, targets. I, and I, th I think actually governments are understanding this. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a pace at which they're able to, to move. That's the, that's the key issue. Mm. Um, you know, in the UK, we, we had uh, a, um, what we call an integrated review of how we look at sort of foreign policy. Mm. And we have uh, decided, we've set it out in black and white, mm. that our top mm. international uh, uh, diplomatic priority is tackling climate change and biodiversity loss. We've mm. set that out in black and white. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that this is the number one policy issue that mm. we should all be looking to work on together. Yes. Uh, how about the private sector? Are they going to join? How, how will they be featured uh, in COP26 uh, processes here? Yes, as I said, there's a number of campaigns that are running in terms mm -hmm. of the race to zero, and they're able to sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, sign up to that. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to, of course, at COP26, showcase the work that's going on in different sectors. I mean, you will know from, yes. from previous COPs, there are certain days designated for you know, transport or energy or yeah. uh, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will have a similar approach uh, in, uh, in, in, in COP itself as well. Mm -hmm. But I think um, what's really important is... Mm -hmm where the private sector can also play a big role is uh, as well as making the commitments themselves mm -hmm. in terms of net zero, mm -hmm. for them to tell government that actually they want to see mm -hmm. more action coming forward. I mean, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the reasons why governments sometimes are reluctant mm -hmm. to act and come up with policy is because mm -hmm. they think that they will have resistance mm -hmm. uh, from business or other parts of, yes. of uh, uh, the economy. Mm -hmm. Actually, businesses step forward and say, no, we, we want to see a policy decision which is ambitious coming forward. We want to see a target dates that are ambitious mm -hmm. and we will rise to it. I think that's a really important role that business can play. Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, private sector uh, in Indonesia have uh, raised concerns that it's not just the capital that they need, but also the transfer of technology, right? And uh, is there any strong efforts to convince the multinationals in, in, in the developed worlds that, hey, you know, uh, invest more in the green uh, investments, the green sectors, but there should be more efforts to transfer capital, uh, sorry, technology as well uh, to make a strong difference uh, on, on, on the ground. Yeah, yeah. so you, you will know that we mm. have a, a, a program called Mission Innovation, which is an international mm. program where governments come together, mm. uh, you know, uh, have a, a shared approach to, to technology. Uh, we'll be launching something called Mission Innovation 2, mm -hmm. uh, which is coming up. And, and uh, again, that's international collaboration on a range of issues. So it's interesting, when I, when I go around the world, uh, people are talking about the same technologies. They're talking about hydrogen, mm -hmm. they're talking about uh, carbon capture storage, they're talking about mm -hmm. battery storage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th these are all uh, technologies that you know, everyone is looking to see mm -hmm. how you can commercialize, how you can mm -hmm. uh, uh, operationalize, and how you can scale up. And I think there is a lot of opportunity for us through mission innovation uh, to try and work together. So those mechanisms are there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you are seeing uh, governments also taking the lead and working on that. And we just need to see more of that happening and for us to do even more. I mean, in, in uh, Indonesia, for instance, um, you know, the UK government uh, has a very good collaboration uh, mm. through um, programs like the Mentari program, where mm -hmm. we're looking at uh, you know, how we can support here when it comes to clean energy transition. Uh, we uh, also have co-chair but with Indonesia, the, the fact dialogues uh, mm. as part of our COP26 work mm. on agricultural commodities. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of collaboration already. Mm. And we just need it to continue and ultimately, of course, for it to deliver on the results that you're talking about. But you're right. I mean, technology transfer and also just know-how. 
Uh, you know, I talked yeah. about revenue mechanisms. Well, I mean, there's a process for us to learn from each, each other. How do we ensure that we get private sector money mm. going into mm -hmm. uh, these industries of the future? Yeah, I, I totally agree because on, on non-climate uh, sectors, uh, the business always said, hey, we invest all this money in R&D, right? Why should we want to uh, transfer technology and, and so on? Yeah. So there's been a lot of discussions uh, in Indonesia on that. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest source of climate um, uh, uh, change is uh, the energy uh, emission. And energy, uh, we're talking about uh, fossil fuel and mm -hmm. obviously oil companies. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you expect the oil companies uh, around the world, uh, which are some of the biggest companies in the world and in, in countries, including in Indonesia, uh, to transform? Well, I mean, you, you see some of the big oil majors. Um, mm. They're already um, you know, looking at their portfolios and they're already talking yes. about how they transition uh, from uh, you know, oil and gas majors to energy companies. Mm -hmm. You're seeing that happening. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, this, there is a, a uh, realization of, of concerns about yeah, as I said, stranded assets uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's what shareholders are pushing for as well. So I think you, you will see this transformation. I think the key issue is that how quickly it'll move and what commitment there is from the leaders of businesses mm -hmm. to bring about that change as quickly as, as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in um, uh, I mean, I go back to this, the whole issue of, of, of coal again, which is that um, one of the things that we've said in the G7 uh, is that those countries will uh, not be financing uh, international coal projects uh, uh, overseas uh, going forward. And we're also looking at uh, phasing out support for fossil fuel uh, uh, overseas as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big, big commitment that the mm -hmm. G7 has made. Mm -hmm. um, you will see uh, South Korea, for instance, um, you know, obviously not part of the G7, but uh, uh, they've also made a commitment on... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, phase out of uh, international coal financing. Yes. Um, so there, there are these commitments that are being made by governments, and I think that also gives a signal to uh, business as well. And at the end of the day, I think one of the things that you know businesses are uh, generally pretty good at is you know, reading what's going to happen and reacting to it. So if you you know we, we go back to this point about uh, you know electric vehicles, I mean, who would have said uh, you know 12, 18 months ago that you know, some of the biggest car companies would be coming forward and setting out themselves mm -hmm. their phase-out dates for, mm -hmm. um, you know, petrol and diesel uh, vehicles, mm -hmm. right? You've got GM 2035. Uh, uh, there's a whole range of country, uh, companies that have set out these phase-out dates. So th they are understanding that there is one direction of travel, uh, and I think they are reacting to that. Yeah, yeah, good. And, and I, I know the technology will, will make things uh, a lot, lot cheaper. In, in near my house, there's a mall. And yesterday I went there and I saw my first uh, electric car mm. uh, being displayed for sale. But it still costs around $50,000. Very expensive. But like computers, la laptops, it's going to go to 10000 right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so, I mean, it will, it will come down to economies of scale. I mean, yeah. you're, you're seeing this. Um, I go back to our, our sort of the UK experience. I mean, I think new car sales now, one in seven is electric. Uh, the key issue, I think, is mm. to ensure if you're if you're talking about electric vehicles, um, you need to ensure that um, uh, you know you are supporting the supply chain uh, in your country. If you have yeah. car manufacturing, you're supporting them in terms of setting up gigafactories, mm. and also, really importantly, you are putting in place a charging infrastructure around the country because you know people have uh, this uh, um, uh, this issue where they they worry about the range anxiety. I think is mm. the is the yes. technical phrase. Uh, and they worry about the fact that, you know, if they buy an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. um, will they effectively run out of, 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 of juice? Uh, and so, you know, ensuring that you've got charging stations around the, 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 yeah. the, the country is really important. And you do see, I mean, in the UK, for instance, we, we support, um, uh, we have a grant for people mm -hmm. who want to buy uh, electric vehicles as well. And you mm -hmm. see that around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the, um, the lifetime cost of a uh, electric vehicle mm. versus a, a petrol or diesel. Mm. Uh, so not just the purchase price, but actually the, the lifetime cost of running this thing. I mean, we are starting to get towards parity. And I think it'll in a few years from now, we will get to parity. And I suspect there will come a point relatively soon where electric vehicles will become cheaper. Yeah. But that needs economies of scale. That needs governments coming together to drive action. And that's why mm. the work we're doing in COP26 as part of our Zero Emission Vehicles Transition Council is so important. Um, and I have to say, I mean, I, I've been really encouraged because mm. 
we we have um, uh, ministers from representing some of the biggest car markets in the world coming together, mm -hmm. and we are all saying the same things in terms of what we need to do in terms of infrastructure, what we need to do in terms of uh, you know creating the right market conditions for electric vehicles, uh, mm -hmm. and there is a real positivity in talking to others and seeing you know how we can collectively move mm. forward on this. So I feel quite positive uh, about technology being a big driver in terms of helping us to deliver clean growth in the yes, future. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask the final question. Uh, I heard your daughter asked you to spread the message to world leaders to pick the planet. Yeah. So do you have any message to Indonesian youth uh, who are watching this now? Yeah. Well, uh, my, my uh, message is uh, very clear. How old is she, by the way? So I have two daughters. Oh, okay. I, my, my younger daughter is 19 and okay. the older one is 21. The 19-year-old okay. the particularly is a, is a, a, a big uh, uh, climate activist, I can mm. put it like that. Uh, but I mean, she, she's representative of her generation. Yes. Uh, I mean, this is nothing sort of, you know, uh, out of the ordinary. The mm. young people around the world are coming forward and speaking. And uh, when I meet them, um, I, I always say to them, please keep speaking up. Please keep mm -hmm. telling your governments that you need to see change because ultimately the future that is being set is their future, yes. right? That, that's mm -hmm. absolutely vitally important. Uh, I do have one thing that I would like to add, which is that um, uh, I think we want to, um, uh, to launch the Indonesia for Climate video competition. Yes. And this is, of course, hosted by the uh, FPCI and uh, the embassies of the UK, of uh, Italy and Sweden in, in Jakarta. Uh, and uh, the theme of this mm -hmm. video competition is many roads lead to net zero, which mm. I think is very catchy. Yes. And we want to encourage all young people, all youth in Indonesia uh, to do an act of kindness for the environment, no matter how big or how small, and then capture that mm -hmm. in a brief video. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a competition. So, uh, you know, you can have a look if you're interested in prizes. You mm -hmm. can have a look on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, FPCI website. Uh, but you know, this is also an opportunity to Instagram this stuff Uh, so this is a competition that is being launched today. I'm very uh, pleased and honored uh, to be part of this launch. But this is an opportunity for us to show, uh, you know, the climate heroes mm -hmm. around uh, the, the country. And, and in fact, this is something for COP26 mm -hmm. that we're also looking at. Is how do we show, you know, the fact that this isn't just about world leaders. This isn't about business leaders. This is about all of us individually making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I do think if we showcase what we are doing, uh, And somebody mm -hmm. else sees that and says, well, you know, I, that person mm -hmm. made that change. Maybe I can do the same. I think it'd be brilliant. So mm -hmm. um, all I can say is, um, you know, come forward, take part in this competition. Mm -hmm. And I will look forward to seeing some of the output as well once it comes through. Absolutely. And thank you uh, for cooperating uh, with us uh, on this. Yes. This is an exciting project. And I think it's a project that can show anybody can be a hero, a climate hero. Right. Uh, so I look forward to receiving uh, the videos and uh, we'll, we'll send you. Send you the best videos. Please do. Yeah, I look yeah. forward to that. Good. Uh, thank you very much for thank having you, me on. Thank you, Paolo. You have uh, spent your uh, time with us, uh, and and we really hope that uh, you will be successful uh, uh, for the Cl uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Everyone is counting on you. You have a big job. You know, just before you came here, I told uh, my staff, look, we have many ministers and world leaders come, but this one is different. Uh, this one is not the title that matters, it's what he's trying to do, which is really to, to save the world, right? I mean, uh, I mean it from, from the bottom of my heart, you have a huge job, and it's not just Britain that depends on you, mm -hmm. it's not just governments, it's really the future uh, of the human race, my kids and yours, and the future of uh, planet Earth. Uh, so, so really, uh, all our best and our prayers for your success And I hope you will come see us again in Jakarta. Well, I look forward to that. And thank you for all your climate leadership as well. I mean, uh, we talk about climate heroes. You are a climate hero. I know you are. You're very modest and you won't say that. But I think we do recognize you as a climate hero. And I think the support that you and others provide uh, on the road to COP26 will also be vitally important. So thank you for having me on. And uh, next time I'm in uh, Jakarta, I will be back in the seat. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
saya Mika Tambayong. Saya Chris Dayanti. Saya Kalista Iskandar. Saya Desa Radian. Saya Chico Jericho. Saya Chelsea Islan. Saya Cinta Laura Kiel. Saya Dian Sastrowardoyo. Saya Wulan Guritno. Saya Julia Stel. Saya Yoshi Suraso. Saya sangat semangat menyongsong Indonesia, Indonesia Emas. 100 tahun yang merdeka pada tahun 2045 nanti. Kita semua di Indonesia bermimpi dan menginginkan agar bisa mencapai tujuan Indonesia Emas di tahun 2045. Sungguh suatu capaian sejarah yang indah dan luar biasa dalam perjalanan bangsa kita. Nggak kebayang betapa hebatnya Indonesia Emas nanti. Insya Allah pada tahun 2045 saya akan mulai mewariskan Indonesia kepada putra-putri saya. Di usia NKRI yang 100 tahun nanti, saya ingin kita semua hidup dalam Indonesia yang Pancasilais, yang modern, maju, makmur, sejahtera, hijau, adil, aman, bebas, korupsi, demokratis, dan tentunya bersatu. Tujuan tersebut bukan tanpa tantangan. Ancaman terbesar di tahun 2045 bukanlah pandemi. Bukan lagi kemiskinan atau kebodohan. Bukan separatisme. Bukan perang nuklir. Bukan invasi militer dari luar. Ancaman terbesar bangsa Indonesia di tahun 2045 nanti. The mother of all problems adalah pemanasan global. Di mana suhu bumi rata-rata akan naik 3 sampai 4 derajat Celcius. Itu adalah suhu terpanas sepanjang sejarah manusia. Suhu terpanas di bumi kita yang sudah berusia empat setengah miliar tahun. Suhu tinggi akan membuat planet bumi sakit parah. Saya tidak mau melihat Indonesia emas dan anak-anak kita nanti hidup sengsara dalam bumi yang panas ini. Dengan perubahan cuaca yang ekstrim di mana-mana. Polusi merajalela dan membunuh puluhan juta orang. Hujan deras dan banjir di mana-mana. Gunung es di Antartika terus mencair. Air laut akan naik setinggi satu meter. Sumber air dunia akan berkurang dengan sangat drastis. Banyak pulau yang akan tenggelam. Semakin banyak spesies punah yang disebut the sixth extinction. Keragaman hayati akan rusak. Suhu air laut yang naik. Ekosistem laut yang terancam. Serta terumbu karang yang banyak mati. Penyakit semakin banyak menyebar. Termasuk malaria. Stok pangan menurun banyak dan kekeringan di mana-mana. Banyak tanah yang akan menjadi padang pasir tandus. Dan konflik berbasis lingkungan yang meningkat juga secara drastis. Semua ini akibat ulah manusia. Namun, malapetaka ini Kaya dapat juga dicegah oleh manusia. manusia. Karena itulah, ayo kita selamatkan Indonesia dari bumi panas. Mari kita mulai mengurangi emisi gas rumah kaca Indonesia. Ayo kita kurangi emisi gas rumah kaca 50% di tahun 2030. Dan kita kurangi terus sampai akhirnya kita bisa mencapai nol emisi di tahun 2050. Ayo hijaukan ekonomi kita, jaga hutan kita. Jaga ekosistem laut kita. Kembangkan energi bersih dan kurangi segala emisi karbon dalam kehidupan kita. Sehingga Indonesia emas 2045 akan hidup dalam bumi yang nyaman, sehat, dan bahagia. Sehingga... Indonesia dapat menjadi bagian penting dalam solusi global perubahan iklim. Planet bumi harus kita sembuhkan dari sekarang. Target besar dan mulia ini bisa kita capai. Ayo kita bergotong royong. Selamatkan planet bumi. Selamatkan umat manusia. Selamatkan generasi kita dan generasi seterusnya. Kita sambut Indonesia emas yang penuh harapan. Selamatkan, Selamatkan Indonesia, Indonesia 2045. Sadarkah Anda, kita mungkin adalah generasi terakhir yang bisa hidup dalam dunia bercuaca normal. Kita juga adalah satu-satunya generasi yang bisa menyelamatkan umat manusia dari bahaya bumi mendidik yang menanti kita selamanya di depan. Ayo kita penuhi panggilan planet bumi, panggilan umat manusia, dan panggilan sejarah. Ayo sebarkan pesan ini dan tanda tangani petisi.